Great. Well, welcome everyone to the session. Um, the panel today is titled From Dissertation to Book, Navigating the Publication Process. Uh, I'm Tim Ballmer from the UC Berkeley Library. And this panel is sponsored by our office, which is the Office of Scarlet Communication Services within the library. Um, and we're here to help answer questions around a variety of issues, um, including copyright in your research, um, author's rights, uh, protecting and managing your intellectual property, um, helping you understand scholarly publishing platforms and tools, um, open access publishing, um, open data, sharing open educational resources, and a lot of other things. So this week we've been hosting a series of publishing workshops mostly aimed at graduate students, uh, postdocs, and early career researchers. Now, yesterday we hosted a session on what you need to know with regard to copyright and other legal considerations for your dissertation. And we went into a little bit about how to incorporate other people's creative work into your own writing, um, and also helping you understand your rights as an author and how you can share your dissertation when it's complete. But today we're hosting a panel discussion about how to take your dissertation and turn it into your first book. Um, later this week, um, Thursday the 28th, uh, we're focusing on some strategies and tools for both managing and also maximizing the scholarship that you create and want to share. Then we're gonna take a break for a few weeks, but we're, we'll come back with another workshop uh, in November on the topic of copyright and fair use for digital projects. Um, and that's gonna happen on November 10th. So if you want to register for any of these upcoming workshops, um, you'll find links on our website, which is listed at the bottom of this slide, um, or also on, on Twitter. Um, we try to push out our workshops as broadly as we, as we can. So today we've got a great lineup of speakers who have generously agreed to share some of their experiences and information on the process of publishing a scholarly book. And perhaps some of you um, are working on your dissertations and are likely interested in taking that research into a book length treatment. And our goal with the conversation over the next hour or so is to demystify the monograph publishing process a bit and give you some practical advice on a variety of topics. So what it'll take to revise your dissertation, um, how to develop a book proposal, some tips for interacting with press editors, um, how to address some legal considerations um, in book publishing and uh, much more. So I'd like to introduce our panelists. So Archana Patel is the Associate Editor of Art History at the University of California Press. Archana joined the UC Press back in 2018. And prior to her current role, she worked at the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center and at several art galleries and institutions in Los Angeles. Annika Lenson is an Associate Professor and Vice Chair of the History of Art Department at UC Berkeley. Most recently, Anika is the author of the book, Beautiful Agitation, Modern Painting and Politics in Syria. It's a study of avant-garde painting and the making of Syria as a contested territory, focusing on the years 1900 to 1965. And it was published by the UC Press uh, last year, 2020. Finally, Rachel Brooke is the Interim Executive Director at Authors Alliance. Now, Authors Alliance is a nonprofit organization which represents the interests of authors who want to take advantage of the digital age to share their creations with readers, promote the ongoing progress of knowledge, and advance the public good. And prior to law school, Rachel worked as a literary agent in a small New York City agency. So just a little bit about the structure of the discussion today. Um, we prepared a short set of questions that are tailored to each individual panelist's role and experience within the book publication process. So we'll use the first half of the session to talk with each of the panelists today. 
we'll start with Arshna first, then go to Anika, and we'll finish up with Rachel. Um, and at the end, we'll have time for you to ask questions to the panelists as well. Um, one thing you can do is that if you have a question as we go along, um, you can either post it in the chat and we can get to them after the panel portion of the session, um, or just hold on to it and you can ask it uh, live at the end. So I'm gonna go ahead now and stop the screen sharing um, because we don't really need the slides and it's a little bit easier to see our speaker. So give me one minute to do that. Okay, great. Um, well, let, like I said, let's kick things off with Archna. Um, Archna, can you give us a little bit of an overview of the University of California Press? Um, what sorts of books does the UC Press publish? And from a more general perspective, can you talk a little bit about do university presses specialize in particular subject areas? Yes, of course. Hello, everyone. It's so good to be here. Um, thank you for the invitation, Tim. Um, so UC Press, we just celebrated our 125th anniversary a few years ago. Um, the press publishes in a wide range of scholarship in the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. Um, we are one of the six largest uh, university presses in the US. Um, and of those, we're the only one on the West Coast and the only one associated with the public university system. Um, we publish about 30 to 35 journals and about 200 books a year. Um, you may have heard that university presses receive, um, can receive subsidy from their university, um, but we, we do receive a subvention, but it's very, very small. Um, the vast majority of our budget comes from sales. Um, different university presses do have different strengths. Um, and at California, we try to maintain active lists in areas where we lead. Um, one of the things uh, my boss likes to say is that we publish in areas where we're one of the top two or three presses um, in that field. I think ranking presses can be a little subjective, um, but we do want to have a dominant, respected list in every area we publish. Um, one thing to note is that, you know, press, what a press publishes can change over time. Mm -hmm. So depending on the individual interests of an editor or depending on the priorities of the press's leadership. So right now we publish, uh, like I said, in the social sciences, so sociology, anthropology, criminology. Um, we just hired a new economics and tech studies editor. Um, in the humanities, history, art history, music, cinema, um, we also just hired a new science editor, but we have a long history of publishing in the environmental sciences in particular. Um, and then we publish in a wide range of interdisciplinary areas. So food studies, Asian studies, American studies, law and society, Middle Eastern studies, Latin American studies. Um, so a wide range of interdisciplinary areas. And it's something that as a press, we really pride ourselves on doing. Um, one quick thing I do want to know about the press is that we are a few weeks away from launching um, what we're calling the first gen program. So it's a program meant to support and provide resources for first generation scholars or first in their family to go to college. Um, I'm very excited about this. There is going to be a whole host of resources because as we know, publishing can be such a black box. Um, there are going to be uh, publishing workshops, so we're actually in the middle of organizing um, a publishing workshop this coming January, January with the UC Humanities Center. We did one last year that was virtual and it had uh, you know, a huge number of people attending, so we definitely want to do that again. Um, and the program is going to have funding attached to it, which means that we... Um, Hey, Archna, we just lost your audio for some reason. Maybe toggle it off and on. It looks like you're still. There we go. Can you okay. Hear? Yeah, now it's working. Okay, okay. I have no idea what happened. You, <laughs> think, you know, almost two years in. <laughs> right. 
Um, anyway, I was just saying that this program also has funding, so we can apply funding for projects for things like indexing, permissions, developmental editing. So it's something that I'm really excited about. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so let's dig in a little bit more to the process um, from the perspective of the press, because I think that's something that a lot of people are gonna be interested in. So say I'm a PhD student and I have a dissertation that I'm wrapping up um, and I'm thinking I wanna revise it into a book. Um, let's talk about some of the stages of this, um, which we know includes things like submitting a proposal, um, uh, then the press actually reviewing the proposal um, and editing that manuscript uh, into a potential book. So let's focus on the proposal first. Um, who, who should authors reach out to at the press? Um, and can you give us some, some tips or thoughts about what should a proposal look like and what should be included? Yeah, um, definitely. I hope you don't mind, Tim, if we could just back up a little bit before sure. we um, get even get into the proposal. I think there's a few things um, that folks should know. So I think the first thing about a dissertation is that you should all be prepared for the fact that your book is gonna look completely different than your dissertation. You know, often I hear scholars saying, um, I'm writing my dissertation as if it were a book, or my mentor says that I can just publish it as is. And the matter of the fact is that that's simply not the case. You know, a dissertation is its own type of genre. Mm -hmm. um, you're demonstrating a mastery and a skill over a specific discipline. Um, you're also writing for about five people, the folks on your committee. Um, who all come to the project with their own expertise. And so when you're thinking about your book project, you wanna be thinking a little bit more expansively, um, both in terms of your audience um, and as you approach the material. So if you're writing something that's interdisciplinary, you may have readers coming to the project without that kind of assumed expertise. Um, and so the way you approach your book can be very different. Um, dissertations are also typically written under extreme duress. You know, scholars are often faced with funding challenges, um, personal challenges, teaching issues. I mean, I'm not even going to go into this past year. Um, and so that's something that, you know, something to consider. Um, but also by the time you complete the dissertation, you complete the defense, sometimes the healthiest thing is just to tuck away the project for a little bit. Um, I always suggest, um, as do many of my colleagues, that it's important to take some time away. Um, and this is a time that you should be reading widely, right? So toss in some poetry, toss in some novels. Um, go, go back to some of those books um, that you discovered during your research that were really interesting and you just didn't have a chance to really dig into. Um, you know, find a book that you think is really successful and figure out what makes it work and use that as a, your own model when you start to thinking about the book. Um, also, I think this is a time, you know, to start thinking about journal articles. You know, it can be a really smart way to get your foot in the door, get your name out there as an expert on a particular subject. Um, you know, finding your own voice in kind of longer form work. Um, it's a great way to build your CV as you head onto the job market. Um, and by going back into the dissertation and looking at it with fresh eyes, you may find that like little golden nuggets, that question that you really want to tug at and learn more about and do more research that can then become the impetus for the book project. Um, oftentimes I'm working with authors where their book only contains one chapter of their dissertation. Um, the thing I will say is that, you know, editors are very aware of fatigue when it comes to a particular subject. And so, you know, if you are tired of your project, we can sense that. And we want you to be working on something that you find exciting, that you are energized about, that you really want to be the reason to kind of break out as a scholar in the wider world of academia. Um, another thing to do, and please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Um, another thing to do at this time um, is to start researching presses. 
So the best place to start, I think, is your bookshelf. You know, you want to look at books that were published in the last three to five years, thinking about who's publishing these and um, how are they exciting you. Um, start surveying the current public landscape. Uh, Pre-COVID, I think strolling through an exhibit hall at a conference was really the best way to do that. You get to see um, who's attending the conferences, what things they're showcasing. Um, for example, as I mentioned, the press publishes in many area studies. So we publish in Latin American studies and Asian studies, but neither of those lists contains literary studies. So that's something that's important to you. If you're someone that goes to MLA, it's something that you should be aware of um, when you're looking at potential presses. Um, I think um, this can become a little harder in the virtual space, but um, definitely look at virtual exhibit halls. Um, you can always look at past conference programs to see the list of exhibitors. Um, start exploring press websites if you're on Twitter. Uh, follow editors, presses, um, conference hashtags. Um, something else that I always like to recommend is signing up for subject-specific uh, e-newsletters. And so if you were to go to the UC Press website, we have a general uh, email list for the press, but they're also broken down into specific subjects. Um, something else that I would uh, consider is doing what you're doing now, which is going out and listening to people talk about their recent publishing experience. So I think as much as we all love our advisors, a publishing experience from 10 years ago uh, is probably not gonna be relevant now. And so you wanna find people like Annika who have just published a book um, and pick their brains a little bit. And then the last thing I will say is that it's important throughout all these different processes to figure out what's important to you. So is it the reputation of a press? Is it the size of their publishing program in your field? Is it the enthusiasm of an editor, the production timeline, the publicity plan? Um, by figuring that out, it will really help you to figure out which presses to then approach. I can also just jump into the proposal as well, but I, I wanna leave space for questions. Right, and that's some super helpful like context for everything that should happen be beforehand. <laughs> beforehand, um, what what about what about the proposal? Can you talk a little bit about um, what should be included in it, or or how it should be sort of formulated? I guess. Yeah, definitely. So publishers often have proposal guidelines on their website, but they typically all want five key pieces of information. So the first one, summary of a book. Number two, um, a short annotated table of contents. Uh, three, a statement about market and audience. Um, four, an author biography. And then five, logistical nuts and bolts. So I'm, I'm gonna go through these uh, quickly. Okay. Um, and so part one is, you know, summary of the book. So I think the biggest mistake that I see here um, especially for authors who are revising their dissertations, is that the summary ends up being an exhaustive statement about how the book fits into the literature or fills a gap. This is the wrong approach. I, I want to hear the basics, you know, who, what, where, when, why, and then, you know, have a clear sense of what is the original argument and story of the book. Um, I should understand by the end of the short introduction, you know, why your book is important and why it matters. Um, and why should people care? Um, you know, the proposal is an opportunity to answer these questions, not just for me, for example, for your editor, but also for my colleagues in marketing and publicity who have to go out to the world and sell the book. Um, so annotated table of contents, I think sometimes people go a little overboard here. But essentially what we want to know is the structure and organization of the book. Um, so just having a short paragraph explaining each chapter. And so we get a sense of how your argument is being developed throughout the book and how the chapters kind of all glued together. Um, in the market overview, this is a section where you want to identify your audience. So who's going to read this book and who's going to teach this book? Um, you also want to include a list of comparable books. 
So what kinds of titles would your book sit next to at a bookstore or on a syllabus? Um, let us know if there's any direct competition um, for the project. So is there another book on your topic? And if so, how was yours different? Um, I also want to note again that publishers only really care about comparable and competing books from the last three to five years. Um, and then if your book is a good fit for this press in particular, you can feel free to list one of their titles and explain it. You don't have to go overboard. They don't have to be all UC Press books, but one kind of highlighting the connection is helpful. Um, and then, you know, let us know if your book has any niche audiences. Um, so for example, my colleague Kate Marshall just did a book on eating disorders. Um, and that book has a significant anthropological audience, um, but there's also a small audience for that outside of the academy. So explain what that looks like and why your book would fit into that. Um, and then finally, I just wanna emphasize that it's important to be realistic about the audience. So not all books are for all readers. Um, our director forbids us from using the term general reader because there's really no such thing. Um, and so just being clear and um, about that audience is really what we want to know. Um, so who's going to teach it, who's going to read it. Um, and then author bio. Um, this is a great way to um, talk about your platform. So I think often people send me CVs and that's great. But what I really want to hear is who you are and who your communities or your community of readers will be. Um, you know, if there's one thing you take away from this um, presentation on my end, it's that your publisher is your partner. And so your platform matters to us. You know, um, where are you online? Do you publish elsewhere? Do you, where do you speak? At what conference? Um, who is your intellectual community? You know, even if you're publishing in a space that's not directly tied to the book, it's always great to know. You know, if you were, um, cited in a news article, interviewed on NPR, um, you know, have been invited to a podcast. That's something that um, will give us an idea into your existing platform. So then we can figure out how to support you when the book comes out in the end. And then lastly, logistical nuts and bolts. So what is the total length of the manuscript um, in words, not pages? Um, your total word uh, image count as well, especially if you are asking for color images. And so these are things that are important because um, they may not always be possible for a particular press. So we're lucky enough that we do uh, color images, but that's not always the case for the press. Um, and I like to say that our, our books are around 80,000 to 100,000 words. Um, but that's different for every discipline as well. So it's just good for us to know. Um, and then in addition to that, um, you know, where are you in the writing process? You know, are you a year out? Are you six months out? It's helpful for us to get a sense of that as well. Fantastic. Um, super helpful to hear sort of the five big categories that you'll be sort of evaluating proposals against. Um, I'm interested, maybe we can talk a little bit about say uh, a project is accepted. Um, can you walk us through a little bit about the revision back and forth between the author and the editor? So what should an author sort of expect uh, within that relationship uh, between them and the press? Yeah, so I would say that it's really important that you revise the dissertation before you reach out to process. And so that doesn't mean that you have to fully complete the revision and then start reaching out. But usually I, I would say like six months is a good time frame. So if you're about six months from finishing revisions, that's a good time to start reaching out to process and gauging interest in the book. And so in between that time, what I found is it usually takes another two to three years to turn a dissertation into a book. Again, it's because you are maybe looking at a different research project or something adjacent. Um, something where you're expanding or choosing a different framework. Um, so it requires additional writing and additional research. Um, as you're thinking about your audience, that really affects how you write. Um, and I will say that our 
director, whenever we bring a first book in for contract, always requires us to have a letter from the author outlining the differences between a dissertation and a manuscript. And again, we're looking for new research and new writing. I think once you are, you know, have a sense of what the book project is going to look like. And so one of the things I like about the proposal is that just writing the proposal is an exercise in itself and should help you, um, you know, get a clear understanding of your audience, of your market, um, you know, see those through lines between the different chapters. Um, and so once a book, once a book has, um, a book project has interest from an editor, I think those final stages of revision is a great time to ask for feedback if that's something that you're interested in. Um, one thing I, I personally like to do um, when I have a project come to me and I'm interested in it is that I, you know, I always set up a phone call or a Zoom call, whatever it may be, just to chat a little bit about the project. But I also like to offer a little bit of feedback at that early stage. So if you're still, you know, six months out from a uh, having a finished manuscript, you have a chance to make some of those adjustments if you need to. Um, but it gives you a chance to see how you may potentially work with an editor, right? So this is your opportunity to ask as many questions as I'm asking you um, and really be clear about, you know, what you want those revisions to look like moving forward. Right on. Um... Before we, before we um, get the sort of author's uh, perspective um, with Annika, um, is there any, anything else that you'd like to share or any other advice you would give to a Berkeley PhD student as they, as they think about this above and beyond what you've, what you've already discussed? Um, I would say that, you know, I think this varies from editor to editor plus press, but, you know, like I said, a dissertation is written under extreme duress. And so if you are in the middle of your dissertation program, I feel like it's okay to just focus on the dissertation. You know, you have to get through step one before you can get to step two. And so if everything that you're hearing right now feels like a lot, tuck it away for later. Um, and so if you need to focus on the dissertation, focus on that. And then when you do start thinking about the book project, you know, what is most appealing to you about the project? What did you have a chance to explore? Um, who do you want to be in conversation with? Um, and then one thing I always ask authors is, what is the goal of the book? What is the mission of the book? Um, is it to be a part of a conversation? We like to call some of our authors scholar activists, and their book is just one part of their program. Um, is it pushing a field forward? Is it a job, which is a completely valid answer? So those are some of the things that you just want to start thinking about. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great advice and guidance. Um, let's let's talk with Annika uh, for a few minutes now. Um, so last September, you published your book. Um, maybe we can look at it by asking a few similar questions um, that I asked to Archana, but getting it from your perspective, the author. Um, so maybe we can look at the proposal, the review, um, and your experience with the revision process as well. Um, so first, let's, let's talk about the proposal. How, how did it work for you? How did you approach potential publishers um, about your book? And how did, you, um, how did it come about being published by um, University of California Press? Yes, thanks, Tim, for the questions. And thanks um, to everybody for attending. And Archna, it's a delight to be here with you since Archna was my, my editor as the book came out. And I'm really looking forward to Rachel's um, presentation also. I've already learned a lot from Archna. And the last preliminary is to express support for the um, lecturers, UFT negotiations and um, possible strike. I see your, your pin. Uh, so the... Um, proposal, I'll maybe follow on Archna to say that, you know, my dissertation was written under duress. I was already <laughs> working, right? I was teaching already and it was horribly delayed because teaching is time consuming and all of those things. Um, and uh, it felt like the book in a way also was a little bit under duress and that usually the timeline to get a book out, you have to meet certain productivity deadlines for reviews in an academic 
position at least. Um, and UC Press was, a, to the point about being a partner, was ultimately uh, wonderfully helpful and understood that, that timeline. And I feel like that's one of the many strengths of publishing with UC Press. The proposal um, for me was at the site of the greatest anxiety, I think for all the reasons that Archna is pointing out, it was the one time where I had to say in advance, this is the, I'm committing to this sequence of argument and here is why. I had a, a pretty clear sense of my audience. I'm an art historian and the books about Syria, art, art and aesthetic thought in Syria in the 20th century as it intersects with political movements. And I, I knew I wanted to speak to art historians as well as area specialists that it was gonna be interdisciplinary in, in particular ways. And I even had a professional organization that I'd done a lot with that I understood could be a network for trying to get uh, attention constituted around the book. But because uh, I too um, really changed the dissertation <laughs> to arrive at the book with a lot of new writing, which I think uh, I'll again echo Archna, it feels like you have to be open to that because you know we are intellectuals, we live in the world and our ideas shift as we negotiate our teaching responsibilities and our learning communities. So I had a fellowship to support writing at the Getty and that same community shifted my whole thinking about the argument. So it, it feels like that process you can, you can read advice on how to be efficient, but it, it feels a little bit counter to the quality of the book to strive only for efficiency until such time that you have to have to get it out. So the, the proposal, I wrote the proposal a couple of times. I had a preliminary conversation with the editor that preceded Archna about the book. She explained that for them to sort of move to the next phase considering the book, I'd have to give exactly what Archna described. And it took me about three years to produce that, <laughs> knowing that I wanted to get it to um, the University of California Press. In the intervening time, I sent a few feeler emails out to other editors elsewhere that colleagues had recommended who they enjoyed working with. And that was primarily because um, my archive of images from Syria uh, it's not available readily. It, it hasn't been published before. So my, my, for my project, a, a primary concern was a press that could reproduce a lot of images mm. and in color. And I think UC actually shifted to it being normative in the art history list to have a hundred color images, which is a rare commitment. That's the other that's another great aspect of UC Press. But initially I was worried I wouldn't be able to negotiate for that. So I was trying to get early interest with a truncated proposal from other presses to see if that was viable. All of which is to say, uh, by the time I worked that out and knew what I wanted to say, it was clear UC Press um, made the most sense. And then I finally put the proposal together. So in a way, I didn't follow efficiently what one should. My, my full proposal came pretty late. Your comment about um, that the color images were very important to you leads me to like another question that I think people will be interested in. And that's around um, what was important to you in a book contract? Like, were, were there other things um, that you wanted to get out of this in addition to the, that piece of it, the, the images? Yeah, those are great questions, uh, Tim. I knew, I actually knew images was the very most important uh, element for me. Colleagues had recommended that I consider the um, cost of the eventual book, which is an interesting thing to think about, right? And in art, in art history, again, we're at the top end because of those color images and the paper stock and the uh, a variety of other um, particular factors. Uh, and you see, Press art history list, correct me if I'm wrong, Archana, but the, there's a sort of set price also. Um, and at $65 for hard, hard, uh, hard bound uh, art history books, which is less than a lot of other presses, again, for a big, substantial 100 color image. Um, so those, those were uh, variables to compare for me, um, trying to think about distribution, network. If So I write on a non-US topic, so I was interested in how the book might get distributed and how available it might potentially be. And I think a lot of people also have a question about e-book versus print. Um, 
which ultimately, again, because I kind of wanted the images out there and we have image permissions, which we'll get to, so I won't take too much time answering this one, are so gnarly <laughs> and so expensive uh, that the, the hard copy, and I was working with Syrian um, rights holders uh, who have a different relationship to uh, legal determinations of property and, and didn't want to sign away what's, what is the language is universal rights. I mean, who actually wants to, but there was a sort of hurdle um, there uh, that the print copy sort of um, parameters that UC Press offered made more sense than a lot of other presses for me. But the kinds of questions of distribution, price point, uh, of course, prestige of the press and the quality of the list. Maybe that's the last thing that I'll point out. Hearing Archana talk about the lists that are cultivated by our expert in editors who are invested in our, our field and our discourse. Um, the idea of a list was something that I hadn't tracked as a graduate student. The, um, the kind of investment presses have in, in building a bench of uh, exciting books um, was something I had to get acclimated to in the way that Archana was talking about by sort of perusing book fairs and trying to understand how books get organized. And UC Press has a great global modern list right now for art history that mm. also made sense. And I'll just add, when I defended my dissertation as a young scholar, uh, I had a political scientist on my dissertation committee who made a very flattering suggestion that I consider publishing a UC Pre and a University of Chicago uh, list that wasn't my own discipline. And my own mentor, when I started at Cal, I shared this like super exciting news and she recommended against that, uh, which at the time was sort of questioning. I was like, I want to be in this list, you know, like, uh, but it was absolutely the right advice because the lists also have to do with the visibility of who you're gonna be speaking to and who might review the book. So there's a way in which this list cultivation is, can be really helpful and meaningful for a young academic um, also. And to sort of trust your editor and their senses and where the conversation's going is a really helpful resource as a young scholar. Hmm. Um, I, I definitely wanna dig in a little bit on the rights issue, um, but, but first, maybe before that, can you give us a sense about um, the editing and revision of your book specifically? Um, what pieces of previous scholarship did you pull in or what pieces from your dissertation did you pull in and sort of how did you deal with that uh, in the back and forth around um, actually developing the book? Sure, yeah. That's a great question. And I see Angela's question in the chat also about uh, whether a you know, whether we should pursue embargoes for our dissertations or not, and how that puts us in position uh, when we publish. And I'm, I'd actually be curious to hear what the others on the panel think. I um, didn't put anything behind a paywall. I immediately made my dissertation available. That was an ethical choice for me. I relied so heavily on Syrian interlocutors and their trust in me. I didn't feel, I didn't want to sit on it and monetize it for <laughs> my academic career. Um, and yet that was in a way an easy decision in that I also expected my project would change. I, I suppose, I think it would probably be different if I had cultivated like a data set or something, right? Uh, for me, my arguments have to do with my interpretive uh, take on materials that ought you know, and by the way, American academia conceives of itself, the primary materials should be available to anybody. They aren't in the Syrian case, but the idea is that those are available and then it's my product is my secondary argument. So trying to navigate that thinking, I just uh, didn't wanna mess with trying to sit on my product. Um, it didn't feel right. Uh, the book then does have, uh, Three of the four chapters have some material I had argued in the disc, but all new writing. Uh, and one chapter uh, I had converted into an article in the journal Mukarnas um, and asked their permission to uh, reprint those findings. In the end, that too, I think every sentence I probably rewrote uh, for the mm -hmm. context of the book so that the argument um, went from start to finish. So there's relatively little in there that went unmodified into the, into the book. Um, and that never got to me sort of asking for permission about that. That was just, as I explained, I sort of sat on this and worked on it for a period of time, trying to 
feel like the book was gelling. Um, and so from, it was rarely a question of quick, can I repeat this? It was, how can I take those findings and um, reconfigure them for a compelling monograph? Right, right. Um, well, let's, let's talk about uh, the rights issues. And I, I know Rachel will follow up with some other information on this as well. What, what was your experience in trying to get permission for 100 Im images? What sort of hurdles did you come across and, and, and sort of what was your experience with it? Oh, Tim, it was tedious. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, my, a lot of my rights holders, I'll say a little bit more. And then I also think in a way it's a little particular to art history, although it may ramify for other fields. Uh, in my case, some rights holders were museums. In it that for a hundred years have held copyright and have robust offices with dedicated people to reply to emails asking for rights and have a price chart that's correspondingly well-developed, right? So the museums that, I think it's often cited, and this was certainly my case, the best funded museums charge the most to allow you to um, reprint their images. Families uh, whose like fathers or mothers have been the artists that still hold it in a private collection, all, nobody charged me a thing. They um, happily gave permission to get that work out into the world. So there was a depressing element of confronting the, uh, the barriers on the, the flow of, of this information and it, it was expensive. I knew it would be art, art history publishing is super expensive and I'm lucky enough to be at Cal where I knew I had to save research support that I accrued over my um, career to put toward image permissions. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I'll say is that um, Syria in the 20th century, well, since 1958, has been a controlled economy where uh, intellectual property is rejected as a principle, right? It's a socialist, it was a social, and now it's like a crony capitalist socialist setting, but it had been a socialist setting. So to write to, um, cultural institutions and request rights was an exercise in uh, the ap aporia between how we treat um, intellectual uh, property. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the end, some, you know, I used WhatsApp and asked, is this okay? And I got back a yes, and nobody would sign a form. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we talked about that. Archna and I had discussions of it, and um, a few things just take on the risk that everybody said, okay, we asked everyone. Uh, and the, the paperwork that would have attached to it didn't get signed, but it's clear that everyone's on board were willing to go ahead with this rather than like um, very artificially hold back information <laughs> that everybody right. wants to see published, right? Uh, and there have been interesting experiments. Somebody, uh, another UC author published a whole book uh, where they just never asked anybody for copyright to see if anybody would go after them, right? You can be willing to try, take that on. Uh, th and this doesn't have to do, this doesn't have to do with um, uh, texts and things, right? Uh, it just has to do with not wanting to work through museums that have purchased the item and they're okay. It's one thing to ask the makers. It's another thing to ask the repositories. And we get these, we get these nested, um, and ever-growing uh, costs associated with these with these elements. Right on. Um, well, is there anything else you'd want to share from the perspective of an author with with um, some of the PhD students here working on dissertations and your experience? Just to say that um, the the guides to this that are available by um, experts like the professor is in, or there are whole books dedicated to this. Uh, they're gonna make you feel bad when you can't follow the steps as they lay them out as if they're so obvious and logical. And just know that, that you know, those are the right steps, but you can't always control for the time and the complexity of them. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I'll be happy to answer questions about my experience. Great, great. Well, let's transition to our final speaker, Rachel, um, and dig in a little bit more on some of the copyright and sort of information policy issues that arise uh, for authors, for authors especially. Um, Rachel, we know that copyright's a, a crucial consideration for, for authors and just in general in the book publication process. Can you like maybe take a step back and talk a little bit about why 
copyright itself is such a key aspect of, of publishing? Like, why does it matter? Sure, sure. Um, well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Tim, for having me. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I'm really excited, excited to speak with you all today. So in general, when an author writes a book, uh, research notes, an outline, or any original work of authorship for that matter, they hold a copyright in that work automatically, simply by virtue of being its creator. And copyright really refers to a bundle of different rights, um, six exclusive rights with respect to a work, including the right to make copies of it, to distribute it, to create adaptations, to perform the work. So, before a publication contract is signed, the author holds all of these rights exclusively and can in fact sue for copyright infringement if others use um, exercise these rights in the work without permission. So when a publisher publishes a book, it needs to get permission from the author to exercise some or all of the rights under copyright in order to produce the book without infringing the author's copyright. And then the publication contract is the mechanism for an author granting the publisher this permission um, so that it can lawfully produce and distribute the book. Right, right on. Um, I think the publishing contract is something that's really, well, it's really important and maybe something that you know people haven't encountered before. Um, I'm wondering, can you talk to us about some of the important like provisions that might appear in a, in a book publication um, contract? Uh, and maybe what are some things that authors should sort of be aware about when they're reading these agreements and eventually signing these agreements? Sure, sure. Um, so probably the most significant rights related section of a publication contract is the grant of rights clause. So as I mentioned earlier, the publisher obtains permission from the author to publish their work in the publication contract. And this permission is generally handled in the grant of rights clause. So the grant of rights clause will say um, what rights you're giving to your publisher to use your work and on what terms. So these will encompass both your various rights under copyright to reproduce, perform, distribute, et cetera, and also the publisher's plans for your work, um, what forms or formats they're allowed to produce like print books, eBooks, audio books, and where the publishers are allowed, where the publisher is allowed to distribute that work, um, just within North America or worldwide, for example. However, the terms under which you grant your publisher some or all of your rights under copyright and the grant of rights clause can vary a lot. Um, you might be asked to give all of the rights in your work to your publisher for all times, um, that is to assign or hand over your copyright. Or you may be asked to give your publisher an exclusive license for all of your rights under copyright. This being said, there is a lot of flexibility to carve up the rights that you're giving to your publisher in the grant of rights clause. So instead of giving them all rights for all time, you can try to limit the grant of rights to only aspects of the work that the publisher needs and can reasonably make use of. So for example, you might agree to give your publisher exclusive distribution and reproduction rights so that it can create a book and sell it, uh, but retain performance rights, which are needed to create film and theater adaptations. Um, you might also try to limit the publication contract by duration. So agreeing to grant your publisher an exclusive rights for all of your rights under copyright, but just for a 10 year period, for example. A third way to limit your rights, uh, the rights that you hand over to your publisher is making these rights non-exclusive. So, this means that while you're allowing your publisher to exercise the various, those particular rights under copyright, you're also retaining the ability to license them to another party or to use them yourself. Um, and finally, you might also ask for language in your publication contract uh, that states that all rights not specifically granted to the publisher remain with the author. This can work as a bit of a fallback in the event that there's any ambiguity about what rights you've granted to your publisher. Um, really quickly, other rights related sections in the publication contract include your obligations. So what you're promising with respect to your manuscript, um, including things like topic and word count that would go in a proposal, um, but also things like your promises, which are typically called warranties with respect to the content of your work so that it's not defamatory. It doesn't infringe anyone else's copyrights. It's accurate. 
Um, and also your indemnity obligations, where you may be asked to pay for expenses your publishers include, uh, your publishers incur if there's a lawsuit involving your work. And then a final rights related section of the publication contract to be aware of is the set of terms that governs what happens when you part ways. So if your publisher is acquired, if your book is no longer selling any copies, or if you or your publisher breaches the terms of your agreement. Um, and I, I mentioned assignment a little bit earlier, and I'd like to talk about that a bit more um, sure. because it can it can have real consequences for authors. So, assigning your copyright means assigning your copyright to your publisher means you're handing over your entire bundle of rights in your work for the entire duration of copyright, which at this point is longer than an author's life. Um, so this is why these situations can be called work for hire. And the major downside here is that it, would, it can leave you unable to use your own work without permission from the publisher. So an assignment means that you wouldn't be able to distribute your work to others, such as students in a class you're teaching without your publisher's permission, unless that use falls, in, uh, falls within an exception to copyright like fair use, which I'll speak to a bit more um, in a little while. But it also means that if your work isn't selling well or if it falls out of print, and your publisher doesn't want to make an investment to keep your work available, uh, you may not have rights as an author to do that yourself and ensure that your work continues to be available. But all of this being said, um, it's important to know that you're not necessarily beholden to the terms of the contract that your publisher proposes. You should feel empowered to negotiate if an assignment or anything else in your contract for that matter isn't acceptable to you. And in fact, in our experience, publishers can be more likely to make concessions like agreeing to a limited duration contract or non-exclusive license if you come to the table prepared to explain your position. Um, but it's also important to know that a publisher's willingness or even capacity to negotiate and compromise can vary depending on the publisher. Mm. Uh, to, to build on Annika's experience talking about um, getting permissions for uh, the images, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about these third-party rights, so not something they are, you're creating, but uh, an image or another piece of content that you want to include, like in a book. Um, can you give us a sense on some of the considerations that authors should have in mind um, as they're going out and trying to secure rights in images or other third-party copyrighted content for their particular book? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm so glad that third-party permissions are a thread in this conversation and that you've asked me this question, Tim, uh, because I've been thinking about this a lot lately. And in fact, Authors Alliance has a forthcoming brand new guide for authors on third-party permissions and clearing them that we're releasing later this week, hopefully tomorrow, we're just wrapping up the finishing touches. Um, and I'm so excited to be able to offer this new resource. It's been a really long time in the making. Awesome. So if anyone, yeah, I'm so excited. Um, if anyone wants to get a PDF once it's released, it'll be on our website and on Twitter, but um, if you wanna shoot me an email or drop your email address in the chat, I would love to share it with anyone who's interested. So um, when an author wants to include a whole or a part of another copyrighted work in their own, like color images, um, they're required to obtain permission from the relevant rights holder, unless an exception or limitation to copyright, like fair use, applies to permit the use. And it's unfortunately, oh, Fortunately or unfortunately, it's quite common for publication contracts to include terms that require an author to deliver documents to their publisher showing that they've obtained all the necessary permissions, um, or in other words, that the author is legally authorized to use any materials owned by third parties that they've incorporated into the book. But as I've alluded to, under certain circumstances, an author's use of a reasonable amount of another's work to prove or illustrate a point may be fair use which doesn't require third-party permission. Um, I'll mention here that in many cases, fair use can be an easier case for textual excerpts. And I think that's one reason why image permissions can be so tough. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to all of the like resolution and color versus black and white and file size, musician, uh, muse museums as intermediaries, all of these are 
really thorny issues for image permissions um, that we cover in our guide. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you do plan to rely on fair use uh, in order to avoid getting permission for the, a particular excerpt, um, it can be a good idea to ask your publisher to include language in the contract explicitly stating that you can rely on fair use. And although publishers sometimes assist their authors in obtaining permissions, uh, unfortunately, the majority of the time, the publication contract places the ultimate burden for this, um, both clearing and paying for permissions on the author, um, just like Annika experienced. So mm -hmm. authors who haven't yet signed a publication contract may want to consider negotiating for more author-friendly permissions terms um, if they think that permissions are gonna be a major hurdle for them in the project. So these can include proposing that a publisher contribute to permissions fees or um, supply like form letters for permissions or even handle permissions clearance on their end. Fantastic. Um, maybe one more thing um, that I was thinking about. I know Authors Alliance also has one of those great little books you've published on um, rights reversion. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what rights reversion is and why an author might wish to pursue this at some point in their uh, in their writing process or after some time has elapsed um, after the publication of their of their book. Yeah, so in the simplest terms, uh, rights reversion is formally re formally reclaiming rights that were previously handed over to a publisher in the publication contract. Authors want to do this for a lot of different reasons, but I think the most common one is when the work has fallen out of print or isn't selling well or isn't widely available and they want to see their work reach more readers. Um, an author's ability to get a reversion depends mostly on the language in their publication contract. Um, there will be, in some cases, a rights reversion clause, although the language um, and all the details can vary a lot. So a typical rights reversion clause contains a condition which triggers an author's, an author's ability to obtain a reversion. Um, common, common triggering conditions are the book being out of print or sales falling below certain thresholds. It bears mentioning here that the rise of eBooks and print on demand editions have complicated efforts to obtain reversions in some cases. So for example, if a, con a publication contract has a rights reversion clause that allows the author to revert rights once the book falls out of print, but also defines in print as available from any retailer in any format. If the work is available as an ebook, it might be hard for that author to obtain a reversion just as a practical matter um, because the publisher can keep the work available as an ebook without significant investment on their part. So once rights do revert to the author, they're free to do anything they wish with them. Mm -hmm. In some cases, authors even find a new publisher that's really excited about reissuing the work, um, investing resources in promoting it and giving it new life. But self-publishing uh, a, a reverted work uh, on an ebook platform or making it openly available under a Creative Commons license are two other options once rights have reverted. Um, lastly, as Tim, as you mentioned, we have a guide for authors on rights reversion um, that covers a lot more than I can in our brief time together. Um, it's available on our website. We have a bunch of other tools to help you with the rights reversion process if you get to that point. Excellent, thank you. Um, is there anything else you wanted to share or any thoughts you have, um, advice to, uh, students who are looking to, to publish a first book? Yeah, um, so first and most importantly, publication contracts can be complicated and daunting, especially for first time authors. Um, I'm an attorney and I find them complicated and daunting. So <laughs> it's, it's normal, uh, it's normal for this to feel a bit intimidating. Um, but because they're so complicated, but are legally binding agreements, it's so, so important to carefully read and understand your contract, um, negotiate if something doesn't seem right, because it will govern your relationship with your publisher from start to finish, from the moment it's signed until, um, I mean, maybe forever or, or your rights revert. 
Um, and then finally, to end on a positive note, <laughs> please remember, and uh, I think Archana alluded to this, please remember that you have allies in this process. Authors groups like us exist to support you and advocate for your interests academic scholarly communications offices like the ones sponsoring this panel often help authors with permissions, clearance, and other aspects of publishing. And lastly, your publisher too shares your ultimate goal of seeing the work published and successful. Um, don't be afraid to ask any of these groups for help along the way if you hit snags or road bumps. Uh, and I'll finish by saying, as for us, we have, in addition to the permissions guide I mentioned and the rights reversion guide, a dedicated, suite of, a dedicated suite of guides for authors on other legal topics in publishing. Um, we've got guides on negotiating and understanding publication contracts, fair use for nonfiction authors and navigating open access publishing. They're freely available as PDFs or um, available to purchase as print books. And we hope, we hope these are helpful. Um, and then, yeah, thank you all so much for your time and I'll look forward to any questions. That's terrific. Um, maybe you want to put the, the URL to those in the chat if you if you have it offhand. Um, thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, this has been incredible advice. I mean, I've learned a lot too. Um, let's open it up to the audience. If people have uh, questions that you want to ask any of our speakers, or if any of the speakers have reactions or things they want to follow up on based on what one of the other speakers said, you know, we have some open time for discussion now. I guess. I'd like to ask that the question that Angela put in the chat be, be answered by Archna, if Archna doesn't mind. I want to know the answer too. <laughs> um, you know, I think this really depends. It, re it does depend on the individual editor. It depends on the individual press. I will say that for most of us, because the dissertation needs to be significantly revised to become into a book, that there's such a sharp contrast when you look at the end between the dissertation and the book project. So if your dissertation is already online and available, um, to me, that's not really a negative because I expect it to change. Um, it's also another reason why we don't publish unrevised dissertations is because they are usually available online. Um, and I, I just wanna echo uh, what Rachel said about contracts that if you have a question you're not sure, definitely ask your editor. We you know, are always um, willing to walk through the contract with you if you have anything that doesn't make sense. Um, please always feel free to reach out um, and ask those questions. And I think it's, um, it speaks to why it's important to find an editor that is enthusiastic about the project and you feel comfortable working with as well. Uh, I can just dictate the chat. Uh, Richard had a question. How complete does a manuscript have to be before sending out a proposal? That's a good question. Um, I would say that when you're thinking about um, writing the proposal and then approaching an editor, I think the biggest misconception is that you have to wait until it's fully finished before you reach out. Um, I think it's actually the complete opposite. Um, you know, we get hundreds and hundreds of emails about potential proposals and queries over email. Um, we do review each and every one of them, but cold emailing an editor is not usually the best way to get in touch. Um, and so if you have a project in the works, um, you should reach out to an editor. And so that could be either through conferences, setting up a meeting, asking, um, you know, asking for a phone conversation, things like that. And so, you know, we want to see have a sense um, to see where the project is heading, but it does not need to be fully complete before you reach out. Uh, th there's another question about um, publishing dissertations on e-scholarship. Uh, did you mean that in relation to um, Angela's earlier question or just like whether that is a possibility or? In relation to Angela's question, so whether it would be seen as negative in some way uh, to securing a book contract later? Um, again, I think this depends on the editor and the press. Um, and so it's always a good question to ask. For I know most of the editors at UC Press 
you know, because the dissertation and the book should be completely different, that it doesn't, it's not a negative to us. Um, but one thing you may want to consider is as you're starting to um, consider journal articles that pull from that dissertation, you may want to look into the specific journal um, and their policies. I will say, you know, the one thing that um, a, a general rule of thumb is that we want no more than 20% of the book to have been previously published. So that's just something to keep in mind. Interesting. Uh, there was a question from Asia. Um, I'm wondering about the possibility to negotiate having the book published in another language, perhaps by another publishing house. And when is it normal to get a contract from the publisher, uh, i.e. do editors want to see the entire manuscript or just the proposal? Um, I'm happy to jump in about the um, sure, go ahead. The, the stage of the manuscript. And so for first books um, at the press, we only send out full manuscripts for peer review. Um, when you're looking at a second, third book, that's when we start to consider contracting at the proposal stage, usually with a couple of sample chapters. And that's because at that point you have a proven record, right? You have a, a, a book under your belt by that point. Um, and so usually the process is, you know, for a first book, we have the full manuscript, then it gets sent out for peer review. And should the reports come in positive, that's when I present the book to our internal committee and offer you a contract. And um, I'm happy to answer the question about foreign language uh, editions. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So uh, the short answer to the question is yes. The question was, I'm wondering about negotiating to have the book published in another language. Um, this can happen in a bunch of different ways. So if the author grants the publisher translation rights, then that publisher can then work with another publishing house um, to like most likely in a different country to issue that work as a foreign language edition. But the author can also do this. The author can retain the rights needed to create foreign editions. Um, and work with foreign publishers directly or um, their, their agents that work with, uh, their layers of agents that do this stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it's common and it's, uh, it can happen in a bunch of different ways. And it implicates derivative rights, which I think I mentioned. It's like right. a form of an adaptation to translate a work. Maybe I'll hop in just to say one thing about my experience of the review process that Archana mentioned that um, we didn't say much about yet on this panel. And I know for me, it was a probably the most significant point of anticipatory anxiety in trying to write the manuscript in order to get the contract because the, you know, the, this is the, um, readers who's, who are not disclosed to the author that are uh, sent the manuscript once the press feels interested, right? To then read and comment on the strengths and the um, convincing qualities of the manuscript and to, if they feel that you've over, you know, the peer review that actually gives some legs to our publishing enterprise. Um, I really was worried that the peer review would lead to um, you know, not getting a contract, right? <laughs> that, that the peer review might be really harsh. So all of these sort of um, efforts to safeguard against that agonizing over footnotes. And I'm not saying that, that that agony wouldn't go away, but I did learn from the process that the, uh, when the, you know, the editor can tell if it's gonna be a good fit, right? Like the editor has a kind of role in understanding what the book might do and uh, can select readers who will give the kind of feedback needed to develop the book better, right? So the, 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 the hostility I expected didn't emerge in the readers. It still takes time for the readers to review the manuscript. You don't know how long it will take. That can be a point of extended time before knowing if you're going to get a contract, which in, uh, you know, for people in academic careers, not knowing when you'll be able to report that you're under contract can be anxiety producing. But the sort of, oh, they might eviscerate the book for no good reason didn't come to pass. And I, I better understood how 
a good editor can cultivate readers to give the kind of feedback that the book might need, right? So it actually felt a little bit like a partnership in the nice way that Archana was talking about and, and less hostile, even while it was still hard to know how long that was gonna take or mm -hmm. uh, how, to, how to sort of plan time to respond to the um, reports when they did come in and, and that kind of component. It, that, that's sort of something you can't control fully. Does anyone else have any other questions? So Susan, Susan asks, do presses work with authors on structural questions or issues with the book as it is proposed, or do they typically keep the structure as it is initially proposed by the author? Um, that's a good question. And it depends on uh, the project, it depends what the author wants, right? So are you looking for feedback on structural issues? Um, and it also depends on where in the process the book is. And so, um, you know, if a book is already done, I think it makes sometimes, it's a little harder to make those structural changes. Um, but again, if you're reaching out with some time to go, um, you have a chance to incorporate some of that feedback. And I will say that I do, um, I do like to give feedback on structural issues. You know, I think peer review is really the scholarly review. And so you're getting feedback from experts in your field. I am not a scholar, so that is not my expertise. Where I come in with feedback is kind of big picture issues, structural issues. Um, it's one of the reasons I think why the proposal is important because just seeing that annotated table contents is really helpful for me. I had a project just come in that um, was really exciting, a good fit for the list. Um, and the author said it was gonna be about 100,000 words and it had 10 chapters. And I was like, I feel like this doesn't add up. And so it was a chance to, you know, get on the phone and talk about structure and be like, you know, do we, do this, the chapter structure need to change? Do the three parts need to change? Um, and so that's something that um, I would encourage you to ask. Richard had another follow-up. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the first gen program at the UC Press and when can we expect that program to launch? Do you have any more info, Archna? Yes, so we're actually hoping to launch at the beginning of November, so only a few weeks from now, which is very exciting. Um, once it does officially launch, there is going to be a bunch of resources and also a bunch of um, marketing and publicity support to get the word out there. And so um, I have colleagues that are on that committee doing that work right now. Um, but I think in terms of the immediate impact will be the funding, um, which we'll be able to attach to each title. And that's something that would happen in conversation with your editor. Um, and I do know that the UC Humanities um, workshop is happening uh, in January, I believe the third week of January. Um, and so that's something I would encourage you to look into and I'm happy to send around that link once it goes live. Um, and then the third part will be just additional resources on our website. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah, I see I had another question. Are university presses open to different author profiles? For example, an author with a scholarly and policy practitioner background isn't the typical academic background. Um, I would um, slightly hedge on that to say that it really depends on the press. You know, every uh, university press has a different, can have a different profile of authors and that can also vary by lists. It can vary by disciplines. Um, I will say at the press, we are definitely open to folks that have expertise in multiple areas um, that have done different things, you know, have different kinds of platforms that we can help you support um, when a book comes out. So that is something that um, we're always interested in learning more about. Especially if that reflects on who you wanna reach as well. Um,
There's another question from Lisa Pina. Can you tell us again the percentage of the dissertation that we can publish as journal articles before publishing the book? 20% you mentioned, or previously published, yeah. Yeah, so 20% of previously published. Right. Yes. And do you, do you, is that generally the same for a lot of a lot of presses or is that? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a good general rule of thumb. Got it. Thank you everyone for submitting these questions too. They're great and I'm thankful for the panelists for answering them so completely. Does anyone else have anything else they wanna ask? I can just maybe chime in. Um, thank you all again so much. It was a pleasure to learn from you. I'm curious if anyone has experience um, working out, you know, I think it's part of a bigger conversation, but like the funding for open access monographs, um, you know, and this is something that, um, as Annika mentioned earlier, like for me ethically, you know, I feel very strongly about producing my work open access, um, but, you know, the, the it costs money to produce a book. So, uh, so is it advised to go and look for that money and bring it with me if possible um, from an external source or like how would that part of the conversation, like when, when would that happen? And like, yeah, advice around that. I can offer a little bit here from the scholarly communications perspective within the library. I mean, you're totally right. Uh, we know journal articles are expensive if you want to publish open access because you're paying the article processing charge and sometimes, sometimes these can be hundreds or even thousands of dollars. When we're talking about book publishing charges to make a fully open access book, you know, it can be like tens of thousands of dollars. Um, uh, one thing that Berkeley has, um, which some of you might know about, is this Berkeley Research Impact Initiative. It's basically a funding program that's run through the library that can help reimburse you for the costs of publishing fully open access articles up to $2,500 per article. And I believe it's $10,000 per book publishing charge if you were to have a, a, a fully open access book accepted for publication. Um, and I know most or maybe probably even all like presses like have an open access uh, pathway. Um, something that you should be, know about though, is like, it's not uh, open access only happens after it's been normally accepted as a book that the press wants to publish. So you can't like buy your way into getting your, your book published from presses. And I know at the UC Press, there's, they have the Luminos program, which publishes open access books. And as far as I can remember, um, UC authors um, get a discount on that book publishing charge. I don't recall offhand how much it is, but that's something that's nice for UC authors that if you were to have your book accepted for publication, you can make it open access. It does cost money, but you get a discount on what the normal fee would be for that. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Ann. I'll be really quick just to, and then I look forward to hearing from Archna and Rachel too on, the, on this question. I mean, it does feel like for an author, <laughs> it feels a little unresolved. There's also the question of how your own uh, home, institutional home uh, understands open access. Um, and the Lumino series is exciting for me. So I'm, I'm familiar with the New Directions in Palestinian Studies, which, ha which uses Lumino's and similarly has a, a political kind of commitment to open access. And what's interesting about the model is that it does start from the scholars institution committing right um so there's a there's a, a sort of recognition of the costliness for an author to publish anyway right like i paid a subvention for images uh, and i'm not saying luminous is a great option for image heavy pub publishing but the sort of recognition of where the costs the costs do also fall on authors often and an effort to to bring a kind of institutional support for the publishing practice uh, that will support a model of circulation is um, appealing to me. So it seems like if you're in a happy position where you get to negotiate for support for your career, 
uh, factoring in sort of participating in these kinds of platforms as part of your profile might make might actually make sense, right? Just like I, all art historians, if they have the option to negotiate, say I, I anticipate needing fifteen thousand dollars to get this book out with color images, and that would be part of re a research support package. Again, if you're in that kind of position to negotiate, so to flag it early and make it part of your profile um, seems to me like a strategy that makes sense. Yeah, I think um, flagging it early is um, also, always a good rule of thumb. Also, when you're starting to talk with an editor about a book that you feel should be open access, you know, we have this great platform called Luminos, um, where we do publish uh, open access. So the ebook is available for free. If people want a hard copy, it's print on demand, usually 30 to $35. Um, and so we don't think of Luminos as like a separate publishing arm. The books go through the same exact process um, where the difference is it's a different kind of distribution channel. And so, for example, we publish a lot of our Asian studies list open access because we are trying to reach those audiences, you know, in different parts of Asia that may have difficulty getting their hands on a physical copy of the book. Um, I will say for Luminos, the baseline subvention, and so the program works by the publisher putting in a pot of money, uh, libraries that support the program put in a pot of money, and then the author brings in a pot of money. And the final amount depends on your word count and art count. So the more words, more arts, the higher the cost, but the baseline is 7,500. Um, and so Tim mentioned that you see um, authors or where if you're at a campus where the library is part of the Luminous program, you do get a discount. Um, we also, for UC faculty, have something called the scientific account, um, where we're allowed to pull from that kind of pool of money to support um, books written by UC faculty or uh, books by folks who did their dissertation at a UC. Um, so we can put that into that kind of subvention requirement for open access. Um, also, you know, letting your editor know that you're interested and this might make sense for the book um, up front, because then we can also do research on our end to find where those additional funding can come. Sometimes at the end of a fiscal year, we have extra funds available and we can make an exception and apply those to a title. Um, the National Endowment for the Humanities has their own open access fellowship program. And so if you were a fellow in any of those programs, let us know, and we can then apply for that subvention on your behalf. Um, and so there's lots of, I think, creative ways to think about that funding, um, but it really um, is key to have those conversations early. Thank you all so much. I, I think we're running out of time, but um, everyone, please join me in thanking our great speakers. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate your experience and your advice and your time. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining. This was, this was great. And we'll be following up with the recording later. Thanks, Tim. I learned a lot myself. So thanks, <laughs> Rachel and Arjuna. Awesome. I did too. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. See everyone. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye.